Hey everybody, it's Norm from Testin, and welcome back to Projections, where we have a special episode this week, hopefully the first in a series of studio visits, where we're gonna give you a peek behind the scenes at the making of some of the VR and AR experiences that we love so much. Uh, this week, I'm gonna take you behind the doors of ILM X Lab, where I had a chance to visit their studios here in San Francisco, California, as part of the Lucasfilm campus. Uh, ILM X Lab, of course, was launched in 2015 as kind of a skunk works project inside of ILM to explore the possibility of storytelling using new technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality. And they over that time have produced experiences such as the trials on Tatooine, the Star Wars droid repair bay, and also the secrets of the Empire location-based experience as a part of the void. Now you guys all know that last year they also released the three-part episodic series Vader Immortal starring this guy which let you using an Oculus Quest or Rift headset go on Mustafar and go up close and personal with Lord Vader himself and use some pretty awesome force powers. I had a chance to chat with director Ben Snow and producer Alyssa Finley along with some of the artists and engineers who worked on Vader Immortal about the making of this series. So let's go check it out. So I'm thrilled to be joined here on this lovely Star Wars show set uh, on the Lucasfilm campus uh, with Ben and Alyssa here. Um, tell me what you guys did on Vader Immortal. Um, I was director of Vader Immortal, also contributed to the story and sort of supervised the visuals and visual effects. Yeah, and I was the producer on episodes two and three. And congratulations, first of all, for shipping those episodes. Uh, it's been super fun to play and also to, to watch the VR community and also gamers and Star Wars fans um, just experience it. Uh, but it's been a journey, not only for this, this experience to be developed and come out, but for ILM X Lab um, as well. Can we go back a few years and give me a little bit of history of ILM X Lab and what Lucasfilm's interest in VR is? Um, ILM X Lab has been around for, yeah, several years. Um, it started with the Advanced Development Group, which was essentially exploring use of real time. How could we use real time for um, visual effects and how could we, you know, leverage some of that technology a little bit more, you know, as we even dating back to things like the Clone Wars and some of the prototyping tools we developed at ILM. Um, there was obviously a, an interest in pushing the real-time aspect of it. And then ILM X Lab came out more as a storytelling. How can we tell stories in different media in different ways? And so um, Vader Immortal was first sort of hinted at, I think in 2015, maybe 2016, they did a presentation at Star Wars Celebration where they showed a prototype that we put together that was Vader um, essentially standing out, looking across the lava plains of Mustafa. David Goya was already involved and very interested, and we were working pretty closely with Lucasfilm Story. So it was originally gonna be a fly on the wall narrative where you essentially observe the goings on. And so the first prototype, oh sorry, the prototype that I became involved in, we were essentially trying to gray box, so proof out, previs, the first script that he'd written, and also, I felt I was really interested in saying, how can we push the visuals of this and you know make it feel very cinematic because I wanted it to feel like people had sort of stepped into a movie if I could. And so we were really beating on that as well. So we made this prototype that had a beautiful sort of section that was very detailed out. And then um, at the same time, this sort of gray box narrative. And we kind of came out of that um, and interestingly had been approached by The Void at about that time to do a uh, Void experience, an interactive experience. And so XLab pitched a bunch of ideas and one of them was sort of related a little bit to what we'd done with this experience. And that was the one they ultimately went on to. So we kind of put the um, Vader Immortal on hold or what became Vader Immortal on hold and then focused on this um, interactive experience. And it was great because it gave us a chance to step back and say, you know, you know, people are going to enjoy this more if they are not the fly on the wall. They're in VR. It's really disappointing to stand in VR and watch two other people have a conversation around you. We want you to be part of it. So we proposed retooling it. A group of us got together and pitched to um, Lucas Story and to the execs here at ILMX Lab. 
And they agreed to let us make a little prototype, which was essentially something that became more or less the cell scene that you see in episode one of Vader Immortal, where Vader comes in and gives you something to look at and sort of hints at some of the backstory that David Goyer had come up with. And uh, we show, made, finished that, showed it, and everyone was like, yeah, this is the way to get going, to, to go with it. And just at that point, Oculus became involved and were actually really interested. They'd seen the older version, but the fact that this was now going to be interactive, I think got them more excited. And then almost at the same time, they were starting to plan for the Quest, which was a new device that, you know, I think when we first saw the previews of it, we couldn't be more excited of, oh wow, tetherless, you know. So it was just, it, it just seemed like a great project. We had to rethink a little bit because of the, the device, but, it was just a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, it, it's so interesting when we started seeing VR devices becoming more popular, especially with hand controllers, yeah. that possibility of interactivity, real-time interactivity kind of go hand in hand. And when you think Star Wars, the first thing I think people think about is, is lightsabers and, and force powers. Yeah. And of course, that's in the experience as well. Yeah. But you're saying that it all started with the story that David Goyer wanted to tell. Yeah. How do you then, as the director, choose what interactive elements are there and what the, the the player going through the experience gets to interact with. Well, you know, it's interesting actually. David Goyer has written games and worked on games, so he had some thoughts in there, but really it was more through us prototyping and doing experiments that we came up with what would be satisfying. You know, one of the things I think a lot of people discovered, particularly with this most recent wave of virtual reality development, is that simple things can be kind of interesting, like, you know, operating, you know, levers and, and that sort of stuff. So there is that aspect to just doing something that you would do in normal life in VR. There's something fun about that, oddly. Um, we knew lightsabers were gonna be a big part of it. And I think one of the things that really drove us to rethink things a little bit was that it was like, oh, you have a story and then you go into a lightsaber experience and then you go back to the story and then you go into some other sandbox and it wasn't really tying it in as much as we felt it should. Um, so, but we had sort of started developing light, the lightsaber stuff, how would different lightsabers work, how would they cut things. We've just put a lot of research into trying to make, you know, this was an opportunity to make it feel like you really were holding a lightsaber in a way that I don't think you can in another medium. So, you know, that was kind of the... And I do think that one of the things that the team really leaned into was the experimentation of not being sure that they knew what the answers were. Like visually, you had a picture of what you wanted yeah. to create, but from an interaction point of view, there was a tremendous amount of experimentation we needed to go, what interactions grab the player? You know, climbing a ladder is one of those yeah. simple interactions that turned into an incredibly rewarding experience when you're in a headset doing it. Yeah. And I think with all of, the as all of the gameplay aspects, like the interaction, like the lightsabers, you guys had a tremendous amount of work to do to put to to find that sweet spot where we're inviting the player into this world and then letting them inhabit the Star Wars universe, like as a, as a character in the story, which is a fantastic balance. And, and one of the interactions that resonated with, really with me with Episode One is uh, you know droids, which was a big part of the Star Wars universe as well, and having my Rudolph's character Zoe be there to kind of be your companion as you're both kind of experiencing the story. There are parts where I'm, I'm turning over to her and the animation, she looks back and, and that kind of recognition, even though it's a scripted event or you know, it's an, a non-real player character, makes it more immersive. You know, it's funny, we toyed with the droid. We were like, wanted to make you connect to the droid. And we actually evolved that first scene in the spaceship quite a lot in the windfall um, to try and explore that a little bit more. And we kind of went all over the place with it a little bit. You know, she started off maybe being a little bit too bossy. Like she would, at one point we had you her send you to the back of the ship to check on the spice crates. You went down there, fiddled with a dial, checked they were okay, and then came back. And it was like, you know, and then you were gonna have to dump them about three minutes later when you were under, uh, under attack. So it felt like she was bossing. So. We sort of said, okay, this is busy work. We do not want to try and make the player have to do something just to do something. If it's not, and we, so we tried to sort of, we got rid of that and tried to make sure it was in the narrative. And instead, because we still wanted you to get a connection with her. And, you know, one of the first things that we 
really proved to ourselves was the, the idea of the character looking you in the eyes and being important, which we'd sort of really explored with that Vader, the smaller test, um, that was key. And so we're like, how do we get Zoe to look at you in the eyes? And so we came up with the thing where you, you, you two guys are working together to diagnose the ship and fix the ship. And that was sort of based on having that one-to-one -one connection. And you know, of course, Maya Rudolph was, we wanted someone who had experience, who felt like they knew what they were doing, but was funny and also was sort of, warm, you know, that you felt like would be your friend. And she sort of had those qualities that I think were essential. Because Zoe's really your voice in the world. Since the player can't talk, Zoe gets to yeah. express for you some of the feelings that you might be having and making her personable as well as, you know, per, as well as um, a little bit sassy, right? Like pushing you, pushing, yeah. pushing, pushing against the world in ways that you might not dare, but that was her personality. Yeah. And I think Maya leaned heavily into that. Which is also a conscious decision too, not to have your character have a recorded voice, even though there is a lineage and a, and a, and a name and everything. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's still something I'm not I think it was, I, I tend to think that that's the way to go. Um, we actually talked to a couple of really um, high profile game designer directors and they were like, you need protagonist voice, you know, this is, and we're like, well, we don't really want to do that for this project because, you know, um, we are making you a character and it was really important to us that you were sort of key to the, you know, you're really part of the story, right? The story wouldn't necessarily be possible without you being there. So, um, but in this case, we decided not to do it. I'm certainly interested in exploring that, um, but I don't know, I felt like uh, in the end, I was happy that we'd gone that way. Another thing that's really impressive about all three of the episodes is the location, the fidelity, and the kind of the scope of the environments. Can you speak a little bit about the design of those and how you found something that's going to work on a mobile headset like the Quest, but also look good if you're playing on a PC Tether, you know, the Rift S? I think the first thing to do is ignore that you're going to be on a mobile headset like the Quest and ignore the limitations of VR. And so when we were doing concept art, um, I Essentially, the brief was pretty like, we are making a Star Wars film, you want spectacle. Like in a Star Wars film, you have spectacle and we want to deliver that. You want this experience of walking to a large space. We know from other VR um, projects we've all played how effective scale and space should be. Mm -hmm. And so as we were structuring it, we sort of came up with, um, you know, uh, the idea that you would be in small spaces and then it would open out and you'd be in larger spaces. So we kind of did all that and did the concept art and even the gray boxing to a large extent without necessarily being overly conscious about what we were gonna do. You know, we actually developed a lot of the key characters in the film pipeline and then said, okay, how do we get this running in real time? And now how do we get this running on mobile? And it's just a lot of work, you know? You can well, keep That's the real qualities. time, right? Because yeah. like in the film pipeline, you don't have to think about scalability. You no. have to throw more hours at the rendering. No, I mean, yeah, I, you go from projects where a frame of one of my characters might take 24 hours to render, and suddenly it's got to be, you know, in crazily short amount of time. Yeah, and on Secrets, we actually, um, uh, K2SO had actually been, they'd run K2SO using Unreal Engine for um, some of the shots in, in Rogue One. But in Secrets, it had to be real time, you know, um, for, for the void. So 90 frames per second, mm -hmm. <laughs> stereo. And wow, it, we re that really told us, you know, to try and, because we basically had a turntable side by side where it was like, oh, it's, it's exactly, looks exactly, you couldn't tell. And so, but the amount of work that put into it was just crazy. <laughs> This happens to be the hangar inside Vader's monolith, uh, which we see here. Um, but mainly the goal of this space was to uh, get you in an authentic Star Wars experience, to make you feel like you're actually in the Star Wars universe. Uh, and uh, capturing as much of the uh, fidelity and look of the actual hangar in all the movies uh, is what we really wanted to accomplish. Essentially, uh, 
what we had to do to get it on those mobile platforms, like you said, because our, our desktops are way more powerful than the Quest is. Um, so what we had to do is uh, take into account as many optimizations as possible. And I think some, some of the most interesting things about this is we actually built this environment using uh, very few sets of textures. Uh, we use what are called trim sheets, which you're probably familiar with. So what we mean by trim sheets is to have a bunch of different detail elements uh, laid out in a way that we can reuse them uh, and cut them up and use them to make many different elements. So this is just the, the normal map for the trim sheets uh, on, the, uh, on the gantries. Uh, this is uh, a piece created by Ben Hale, one of our uh, great environment artists. Uh, and you can see that we get uh, a ton of usage out of this and there's a lot of different pieces on here that we use uh, to make this whole gantry. So, Instead of having a texture for each one of these pieces, for this one, this one, you know, there's quite a few different pieces, including these barriers, it's essentially all made from that one trim sheet, including all the detail on the bottoms and the sides and uh, all, the, all the little doodads and greebles that we have running across all these pieces. And you're just maximizing the capability of the hardware for the size of each of those sheets, and exactly. as few of those as you need as possible. Exactly. It, it uh, helps cut down the memory footprint so we don't have to put as much on the headset itself. And uh, it generally works very well for getting us a lot of variety. You just have to get a little creative how to use them. This piece here looks very complex. Um, but essentially, it's all made up of trim sheets. So, very Star Wars, very much in universe. Uh, a lot of visual interest and a lot of elements to take a look at. But again, this is only two textures. And the cool thing about this is it shares the same materials and textures uh, as click. Uh, even pieces like this, which are just, just some ceiling pieces to add some detail. But uh, you can see. We've duplicated the same same kind of elements on this thing and made a whole new object, uh, something that's you know very much looks like it has a purpose, um, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. uh, very Star Wars at the same time and cost effective. So. Well, not only is it visually Star Wars, but also the way you're going about making it is like the ILM model shop days. You're, uh, absolutely, you're building model kits, freebie pieces, and as opposed to having to you know have. 50 different model kits, you're using the same four or five right. over and over again yeah. and then generating that same look, yep. which is yep. Star Wars. This is essentially kit bashing yeah. at its finest, yeah. In terms of the vehicles, this is one thing that's actually near and dear to my heart because uh, I, I was originally tasked with uh, making the Windfall, and mm. that's our uh, unique ship in this, uh, in this experience and in the Star Wars universe, so uh, I was real happy to work on that. So I wanted to show you just some of the, wow. some of the modeling we've done for the Windfall here, and again, this this will end up being a game model, so this this is uh, kind of cut in half here, and I duplicate it as much as possible just to be as efficient as possible. But essentially, I went ahead and modeled this whole uh, ship, uh, and very much uh, it's very similar to uh, the Falcon because this is a smuggler ship. So I wanted a lot of sort of Falcon esque elements, like the uh, the radar dish and things like that. And this was greatly informed by Stephen Todd, one of our amazing. Uh, concept artist. He did a great job on this and gave me all the information I needed to take it to the next level. But uh, if you remember in episode three, uh, Zoe comes out of the uh, hatch on top of the windfall here. And we could have just, just done that as, hey, here's just a hatch. It goes nowhere. It doesn't matter. No one's ever going to see it. But the truth of the matter is we actually spent, uh, I spent some time <laughs> modeling the whole interior of the ship. So this, this whole ship has a complete interior and it even has a, a lot of uh, working features like uh, the, uh, the lift that Zoe would have used to get up to, uh, get up to save you in the end of the experience. Uh, so all, all the things like that are still in there, even uh, if you take a look at some of these areas here, if I can hide them, you can start seeing some geometry that's underneath there, including like engine exhaust, uh, it's all there, ready to be uh, cross-sectioned out. Uh, and, that's and that's unique good. for, for uh, a ship because you're creating it for this experience specifically. You're not rebuilding like the Falcon or a TIE Fighter that's been seen, that's been created in a bunch right. of different ways. Like this becomes the master reference if the ship is used again. Absolutely, yeah. This is definitely where everybody's going to start is from these, these files that I've made. So hopefully someday the windfall will be somewhere else and uh, I'll get to have been a part of that. Here's an example of what a concept art would be. And this is really the, the inspiration uh, for, for the beginning of lighting. 
So what we, what we will sort of extrapolate from this particular image, um, which is like a concept artwork, is the, the mood um, and the, the, the intention, what, what, the, what the character is going through, what, what we're hoping to inspire you to feel as you, as you experience this part of the story. And so what, as a lighting um, designer or a lighting TD, we, we break down this image. We take this image and we, we break it down into visual components. And visual components are basically building blocks for an image, for a picture. So in this case, you can evaluate it based on color, saturation. You can um, 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 look at it from the point of view of contrast. You can look at it from the point of view of, of depth, like sort of de um, depth cues. And so s those are some of s what we'd call basic components. And you use those components to, um, through what they call affinity and contrast to either increase the intensity or reduce intensity and for the visual experience so that it matches what the story, what's happening in the story. I find that uh, concept of cognitive load really interesting because we've got a, a, um, a visual sense of the, the development of an environment from the gray boxing to a fully textured and, and post-process effects. And when you look at the finished scene, it looks in my head so much more complex than if you just look at the geometry, for example. How does lighting serve to you know, hide the fact that their geometry is focused in a certain area or that you're developing for things that need to be rendered in real time that need to run on these headsets? Yeah, I think that definitely, you know, working with the environment artist with, and, and, and of course taking my cues from the concept art, um, I, I come to understand um, what, is, what is the general um, ambient level of lighting in that environment um, and where are the sources and starting with something like that I think the hangar here in, in episode three is, is sort of one, or more, one of our more complex, complex locations and as you can see there's, there's all these little icons you see here are actually indications of light sources wow. and so um, and I think part of the challenge for um, part of the challenge for lighting initially is to make sure that there's that it that it sort of matches the mood and intention what's happening and and that the the location feels believable um, in this case it's a hangar so the scale of it is really um, immense and so with with that scale the way that you can help um, um, illustrate um, scale um, like a large space is actually by a certain level of visual complexity and what that would mean is like multiple sources the the light fall off of the sources is very local meaning short fall offs um, because you know it's it's not something like the sun which has this sort of infinite fall off you have much smaller lo local sources but they collectively will light the room so it's um, almost like a forced perspective but with lighting correct right? your yes. smaller lights make things you think like things are further away and you're hiding in, in the shadows, the corners, so you don't see the edges. Sure. And, and I think, I think what, the, um, what I also need to consider because of the technology that we're using in the software is that when I light the environment, I'm also lighting um, what would be called um, um, the indirect lighting cache, which is um, like light probe information, which is volumetric light maps for for the moving characters who are who are moving through that space. And in this case, in the hangar, when I when I light it with these multiple lights, I also have to be mindful of how I'm lighting these light probes because a stormtrooper might be running through a certain area, and if I'm lighting a part of the wall just for the wall and not being mindful of the characters that are running through there, then those characters are going to be you know, hit by a really hot light, and which won't make any sense in the space. And so part mm -hmm. of my design is to be able to design, and I'll show you what that looks like, volumetric light samples. And as you can see, this exposes really the light probe data that's generated through the static light map um, when I bake light maps. So I kind of, I work with baking you know, the static geometry, which is the environment, and at the same time lighting these light probes to generate enough information so that when I 
when I bring a character in here, I know that um, they will have the appropriate level of lighting for this set. The first time when we when we got the, the Quest headset, um, my my biggest concern was there's no way we're going to actually be able to light Vader successfully on this Quest headset because you know there's there's no shadowing, there's um, I can I can only have four dynamic lights at once and that's taking up most of the GPU and so that leaves no room for anybody else. So I really had to go okay well what works what can we you know, what what bag of tricks do we have and one of them is actually to light through uh, cube maps and so this is like and this is an example of like what i would craft um in set um and and do and make a a 360 cube map to be the light source for a character like um vader and you know vader is, is such an iconic character and um and i think it was for for us to hit this sort of technique and look for Vader um, made me more optimistic that we could actually manage to pull this off. I mean, um, you mentioned dynamic lights as well, and Star Wars franchise has perhaps the most iconic dynamic light, the lightsaber. Of course, right? of course. And so you also have to factor that in as well, and how the player's use of that, and even characters like Vader interact with the light design of the scene. And, you know, and the, the I think what's, what's um, great about that is dynamic lights are there you know it's 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 real time so it it it, it is it it's such a it's alive really so i think it, it's great when we have you know because a lot of the, our environments um um we will bake that that sort of high quality bounce lighting gi ao we bake all that into the environment to to keep the complexity and the look which is more in line with um, a filmic look, a cinematic look, and also the look of Star Wars. And so, to be able to to have some tools on the for the for the characters was was okay. very important. I think that was one of the biggest advantages coming into a Star Wars project with a with ILM and the force of ILM behind us, yeah. where when Ben would lay out his vision for an area and you know if, if we if it was going to be something like the hangar scene in episode three where it was like oh and there's going to be a droid army and they're going to be marching <laughs> in and then there'll be a war with the with the stormtroopers and from a pragmatic producer point of view I was like <laughs> I think we should maybe look at that and then Ben was like no 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 this we do this we do these things and that turned out to be the biggest truth of this production is that the magic is real but the the things that the, this team can do to pull together this abstract concept of a battle happening on a droid floor on a, on a on a hangar floor while you're watching from above, and to turn that into something that's absolutely spectacular on the screen, like that is uh, that that is I think why this experience is as immersive as it is because there from every frame you're thinking about not just the foreground experience of the player, but how to enhance that with the whole of the How does it feel like Star Wars? And you know, you've got to have a battle scene. Yeah, yeah. And, and in addition to the, the large scope stuff too, I think you guys did a really good job of also just focusing on animation, on yeah. near field stuff. Some of the most impressive things are when you're holding artifacts and they really come alive yeah. with <laughs> animations or whole walls. Come on, can you speak to some of those animations and things that aren't necessarily compute heavy, but just yeah, pure well, artistry. I mean, that is that is. We have a mixture of artists on the project. Um, you know, uh, Chip Carl and Colin Henham were our animation supervisors. We did mocap. Um, we had some really seasoned, great performers like Julie Nathanson and T.J. Storm, who, you know, he he played Vader and Julie played a, a number of characters, including the motions for Zoe, and they bring a lot with what they do. It's a little different though, you know, real time compared to my experience on film. On film we will do mocap on the stage and then we will have a lot of time to polish it. And so that was kind of, you know, understanding that, oh no, we need to be directing on the stage what we're gonna do because we don't have as much 
time to polish. Um, also another animation that's in the experience, you use a VR tool, I believe, Quill, yeah. it, like the, for the flashbacks. Yeah. That was really, really delightful to see. You talk about the decision to use that and how those animations were done. Yeah, it was an interesting thing. So um, one of our briefs was to look at different ways of telling stories. And we talked a lot about environmental storytelling. We had this idea of freezes. So we knew we had to tell a backstory of Lady Corvax. And uh, I mentioned that we sort of work closely with Lucas Story, and that includes all the way up to Kathy Kennedy, who was sort of saying, look, I think you need to, one of her big notes was, I think you need to give us at least the, the stakes in the first episode. So we're like, okay, well, we want to sort of talk a little bit about what Lady Corvax did and, you know, the things she created. And so we talked about maybe we should make some statuary and we actually did a little bit of that through the experience and there's graffiti sometimes you see there. But in this case, we thought, okay, we'll have the priestess tell you a story and then, you know, it would be great to have images that go along with that. But rather than her being like in a gallery and showing here's a carving of this and here's a carving of that, it would be really good if it could surround and immerse you. So essentially we... Uh, said we wanted to use Quill and Oculus were really supportive and they put us in touch with some of their Quill experts. But really it came down to um, our concept artists here in the ILM art department for the first one was Chris Foy. And he um, learned Quill, taught himself Quill. And then with Ford Hugh, one of our um, effects artists here, they worked out how we could get that in first into um, to play on the Rift, which of course, you know, obviously um, there had been Cool projects for that, but then to get it onto the quest as well. There was some initial feedback that people weren't really sure about that scene. And so it was great, of course, when it came out and people were like, yeah, we really love this. But by then we were already well into episode two. And we kind of said, look, we do want to have another scene like this. We really liked it, you know, internally. Um, but because it was the uh, Black Bishop narrating it, we felt like we could do something different. So we kind of looked at more expressionistic styles and we wanted it to be a bit more unsettling and nightmarish. So that was kind of the brief there. And, you know, again, Ford and, and the team sort of just really brought this, okay, how do we make that work so that we can, uh, we can do something a little different. Yeah, it definitely felt like an experiment that succeeded. Uh, and let's talk about lightsabers and, and force powers. They want to go back to the, the core of Star Wars. I, I can only imagine what the, the pressure must have been to get that right, because it's something that in VR, people have an expectation of how that can work. And, and you have these motion controllers, but everyone in their mind knows, you know, has played with a toy lightsaber yeah. or has imagined force powers and what was the process of getting those things to to feel right for for fans and for vr users well you know we had done um a little bit of exploration with that of course going back to trials on tatooine several years ago so there'd been a little bit of work on that and then actually colin mckay who was our design director on the first two episodes put a lot of work into that and ninja theory who were an uh, outside collaborator that we worked with uh, that did a lot of work on episode one did a lot of development and research early on to how we would use the lightsaber, how it might cut and that sort of thing. Visually, we kind of have every advantage because we've done them for the movies. And we also had the advantage of Skywalker Sound. So, you know, uh, the Skylab team that are part of Skywalker Sound that work with X-Lab, you know, did a terrific job and just, you know, they would do things like, if you put it up to your ear, it would sound, you know, different. They really put a lot of work into making the saber as feel. And I think a lot, that really helps all of that. Then we had all these, you know, how does the saber move through space? And it was funny because uh, Oculus had Beat Saber, of course, and a couple of other things where you had trails. And they're like, well, no, it should be like that. And we're like, and I'm bringing up footage from the film and saying, no, this is how it looks in the film. And that's the look that we want to try and keep to because that's what you expect. So I think it's, um, it's having that, that, it's in our DNA, I suppose, mm -hmm. helps. And I think from an interaction point of view, we were really lucky in that we got the chance um, to make, to build this, the standalone lightsaber dojo, a piece that's outside of the story world, yeah. but really lets the player get in there and learn how to wield that tool. And we had an entire team and I, um, 
led by Jose Perez, our, our experience designer, yeah. and an entire team of programmers and designers and, and artists working together to make the feel of that experience and the play, the usability of that experience. Like they were working that in on that in parallel with the team working on the story yeah. for the extent of all three episodes. So they had a lot of time to be polishing those interactions and make them as good as they could be. Yeah. So the first thing we did uh, was we had this really cool thing where we could build up our dojos over the course of three episodes. So for the first episode, we focused purely on just the lightsaber, and which I think that was a really smart choice for us because the Force added a ton of extra abilities. So just focusing on the lightsaber, we could dig deep into haptics, making sure that it felt good. As soon as you light that lightsaber, that's like that's an iconic moment, right? So making sure that it kind of like has the good haptic bump and it lights up and you get the good audio there. Um, worked a lot with uh, binaural audio to make sure that you could hear it um, in all the places. And then a lot of it was just making sure that the lightsaber felt right when you were actually attacking enemies and slicing enemies in half. And that was a, a massive challenge, especially on Quest, which is you know not as powerful as what you're going to get at home on your, on your huge, huge machine. So um, digging into the lightsaber first gave us the ability to think a lot about what it means to do melee combat at all, which is really difficult, right? Because of the obvious reasons. You don't have any resistance if I hit another lightsaber. So we, we built a lot into our actual design of our characters to accommodate that. So you'll notice that we have like this weird kind of octopus droid that we have our training droids. And when you're uh, kind of clashing with them or blocking, they, they have multiple arms so they can kind of spin around the other way. So we were thinking about a lot of the ways that we could get some of that action when you don't have the resistance. Um, and so we were able to just kind of build off of that for the next couple dojos. So once we figured out that, okay, we got the lightsaber feeling good, we finally got some cool slicing mechanics, we're learning how to block, how to parry, um, and just really getting that, that feel down, then for lightsaber dojo two, we had an opportunity to introduce the force because we were doing it in the um, kind of the main story experience as well. And so that was taking, okay, we have this lightsaber and it works pretty good, what, what's the next step for that? And the first thing we did was really just focus on uh, kind of the intent of how you use the force and making sure that it wasn't um, it wasn't a bunch of just buttons. You know, we didn't want to like just highlight things and press buttons and just like you know this button moves it forward, this button moves it backwards. We wanted to make sure that we we made the fantasy of that work right. So you reach out your hand and even though there's a button, it's just that one button, which is the same button as grab. And so using that to to lift things and levitate things and move them around and and fling them was just kind of a natural extension of what you would do with kind of your normal grab mechanics, but then we had to put this whole other suite of, um, of messaging around it to make sure that it would work right. We did a lot of interesting things with the throws to make sure that those would feel good. Um, so yeah, we just, we just kind of kept building on it from there until we could add more lightsabers. We finally got into two-handed lightsabers and crazy Darth Maul lightsabers and all of that stuff. So it was really just, um, we had a, a really great opportunity to slowly build up to Dojo 3 where we could throw everything in the kitchen sink at you. So you mentioned intent, right? Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that's very difficult as developers to figure out because yes, you have input and way more input than a traditional video game experience with right. kind of motion controls, mm -hmm. but you're also talking about putting your hands out there and then reading someone's mind essentially. So how do you design so that you can make someone feel like they, you are reading their mind and, and yeah. letting them lift the thing that they're looking at. There, there was a bunch of little things that we did. Um, so kind of as you're moving your hand around with the force, it's, it's basically a ray that's casting out, right? And that ray is hitting these different objects. And when it hits those objects, we'll give you a little bit of a rumble. And then we'll put a little bit of a faint glow around those things. And that little rumble is symbolizing, you know, hey, you're kind of able to kind of use this thing. Once you grab from there, it just works. And that works on all the things that are flying around. So it's subtle. I don't know how much people notice it, but if you kind of move your hand around, you are getting these just little tiny subtle haptic feedback that's letting you know, like, hey, that's something you can grab over there. Now, going back to lightsabers mm -hmm. and, and melee combat, also something that VR kind of struggles with. You mentioned resistance not being, the, the haptic feedback is something yeah. you can't do right now with motion controls. Did you yeah. have, you know, some, some solutions, developers have looked into you know, creating physics-based objects yeah. and modeling your arms, or any times that you guys experiment with that? Yeah, we and, did. Yeah, we experimented with different weights, and so there are some times in there where you'll be fighting a larger droid, and when you get into kind of these clashes, we will bend your hand a little bit to, mm. to kind of accentuate that and make it feel like it's a little bit stronger. But for the most part, we wanted it to be as one-to-one -one as possible because otherwise, you know, you kind of start to disconnect at a certain point. And if my hand is floating way over here, but I know my real hand's here, it just doesn't feel the same. And so we wanted it to be 
as true as it possibly could to you know what you would expect from a real lightsaber. And you know, lightsabers in general, it's kind of the perfect weapon for VR, right? I mean, it slices through anything. So we had the perfect excuse right off the bat with that, um, which was great. And something that you can do with lightsabers, obviously, deflect. And yeah. the way you signal that is with with cues as well. Yeah. Talk about designing that system to make it feel like you are a Jedi, so you can deflect blaster fire. Yeah, that was super fun. We went through a couple different iterations on that. For a while, we were going to like slow slow time. Mm -hmm. We kind of played with that, but it didn't feel right for the experience that we were making. And so, um, at first, there was also kind of like a baseball bat way of deflecting things back, which felt weird because that's not how Jedi's do it, you know. And so, in the end, we went with a system where the lightsaber itself is more like a mirror. Right, so it's more about kind of holding it vertically and pointing at the right places to do the deflection. And then for the telegraphs to know where you were being shot from, we'd give you like about a second and a half um, telegraph where you'd get a big light and a sound would go before it shoots, right? So you'd have that feedback that you could see. But what's so exciting about um, Quest specifically is the binaural audio, right? So as soon as we started to get this moment where it would fly behind you and I'd be fighting a droid over here and I would hear it, you know, with the audio, that was actually, I thought, the coolest telegraph stuff that we could do because you, you started to feel like a Jedi where you're like fighting something here and you hear the and you, go, and you can immediately go back and, and block it. So it was a mixture of, of audio and then just really clean telegraphs to show where everything was going. And so we leaned into that hard for the dojo and it was definitely something we talked about a lot, making sure that you, know, you weren't getting attacked too much from behind, but we were playing with that space and, and really letting you do cool things like when a blade remote's flying it, you can go like this and it slices you know, on your back before it gets wow. there. And so really just digging into it and letting the systems kind of be and, and do their thing. The project's all wrapped up. Um, are you guys still thinking about VR interaction? Are there things that, you know, if you guys were able and given an opportunity to, to explore storytelling in VR and Star Wars more, would, would you feel like you would, could push things further even? Oh yeah, I think you know as as we said um, you know earlier, or maybe before the interview, we were talking about how um, virtual reality is still evolving. We're still learning so much about it, and I think that yeah, coming out of this, it's it's you know ILMX Labs is continuing to do new projects, new explorations, and so I hope we have a lot of you know rich time to explore and and to try new stuff and keeping tabs on changing hardware and changing feature sets absolutely of, of the hardware i mean that's going to be you know it's it's just going to get better right it's like it's funny because i was um one of the films i supervised was star wars episode two which was one of the first big films to do digital cinema and you know there was a lot of and this, even to this day there's a lot of old film versus digital and you know we're, i was sitting there saying this is as bad as it's ever going to be, right? The the the, le the quality level here, it's only going to be better and better, and it's sort of limitless with digital. Like, the um, dynamic range is going to be infinite at a certain, you know, everything can get to a higher fidelity level than film will ever be able to because of the limits of physics. And I think that's why it's so exciting to be working with folks like Ben and the team of artists and designers at X Lab because. Nobody's letting the limitations of what we can do today hold back their vision on what VR can bring to yeah. the player. And I think that it's, it's, what, it's why I love my job. Yeah, it's important for us to keep looking at what everyone is doing and be a part of it and don't go in saying, hey, we have the answers. You know, I think we definitely felt like we discovered some things that um, just that we were able to evolve during the project that, oh, okay, well, this is good, yeah. These are sort of principles that might guide us in future. But, you know, it's, um, it's, still, it's still something that, I, you know, the industry's still growing and hopefully it'll grow a lot faster and faster and faster now that we have things like the Quest. And um, I think that we were hoping that uh, Vader Immortal gave people who hadn't experienced VR a comfortable way that sort of demonstrated to them hey, this is really cool, you know, that got them excited, you know, and even if they are, oh, I don't want to put the headset on or, you know, this is a bit, and then they put it on, they're like, oh, okay, I get it. That's, that's kind of what you go for. I think the appetite is there and I can't wait to see what's to come. Thank you both so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.